<laughs> and I would invite the rest of you to turn in your Bibles uh, again to Exodus chapter 20. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. After the American Civil War, infrastructure in the state of Louisiana was in shambles because there had been uh, at least 20 battles fought there. And so a creative solution was proposed for reconstruction in the South, the formation of the Louisiana Lottery Company. It would be given sole right to sell and distribute lottery tickets in the states with the condition that $40,000 of profits needed to be quarterly put into the state treasury. Well, the state assembly approved the scheme, but immediately there followed a lot of fierce opposition due to the concerns about corruption, but also just the morality of funding reconstruction this way. So to establish a more positive and principled image, managers of the state lottery approached some of the Confederate generals to endorse it, including the well-known General Robert E. Lee, promising that if he put his name behind this lottery scheme, among other things, he would become very rich. In response, it's said that the convalescing general straightened up in his chair and shouted, gentlemen, I lost my home in the war, I lost my fortune in the war. I lost everything in the war except my name. It is not for sale. And if you don't get out of here immediately, I'm going to break this crutch over your heads. <laughs> Most people are very protective about their name, not wanting it associated with any negative thing, not wanting it dragged through the mud, as we say, disparaged and disrespected in any way. And that's because we all know there's a strong connection between one's name and one's reputation. If your name, for example, is, is linked to something undesirable, it will likely have an undesirable effect on how other people think of you. Or if someone uses your name to bolster something that is untrue, other people might think then you are untrustworthy. Or if your name is spoken foolishly and, and flippantly by one person, it's quite possible that other people will stop taking you seriously. In other words, you might soon have a bad name, which is just another way of saying a bad reputation. And it's for this reason that you expect other people to be careful with how they use your name, and they expect you to be careful with how you use their name. Now, if that's the case for our names, certainly God would expect his name, the name that is above all names, to be handled with far greater care. Don't you think? Well, as we continue in our sermon series through the Ten Commandments today, we come to the third commandment in Exodus 20, verse 7, which, of course, addresses this very thing. We read, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So the first commandment, you'll remember, prohibited the worship of false gods. The second commandment, then prohibited the worship of the true God falsely. Well, now the third commandment, which continues to be, be vertical, you could say, having to do with our relationship with God, it prohibits using God's name the wrong way, which initially might not seem quite so serious of an offense as the previous two. Is taking the Lord's name in vain really as bad as idolatry? I mean, cursing and swearing and OMGs are obviously wrong. But to be number three in the ten foundational moral laws of God in every age, are we missing something? Is it really that serious? Let's find out as we take a deeper look here into verse seven, which first of all addresses the meaning of of God's name. So as God began to speak to the nation of Israel at Sinai here in Exodus 20, he reminded them in verse 2 of who he is. He is not one God amongst the many pagan gods. No, remember, he is the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and the house 
of slavery. In other words, what he did is he first and foremost highlighted his name, just as he does here again in verse 7. I am the, uh, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Lord, of course, being Yahweh in Hebrew. Uh, This is a name that's used 397 times just in Exodus alone, but it's first revealed in Exodus 3. So in Exodus 3, verse 13 to 15, we read this. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. So God's name is very significant. Uh, the Lord or, or Yahweh, it's connected to the verb to, verb to be. It literally means I am who I am or I will be who I will be. And, and just in that name, it reveals a number of things about him. It reveals his self-existence. It reveals his self-sufficiency. It reveals his supreme sovereignty as the one true God. But it's also related, we see here, to his gracious covenant and his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promised gracious blessings, showing that the Lord is also the one true God who saves. And so just in those those few verses there alone, we see that God's name is much more than a title. It represents his reputation which was a common understanding in the ancient Near East. Names were were really shorthand for who a person truly is, their their identity. Something we see more explicitly later, if you want to turn to Exodus 33, when Moses asks God to show his glory, and God speaks his name. So in verse 18 of Exodus 33, we read, Moses said, "'Please show me your glory.'" And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to him, I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Well, go to chapter 34, a few verses later in verse 6 and 7, that's exactly what happens. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in faithfulness, faithful, sorry, in steadfast love and faithfulness, <clears throat> keeping steadfast love for thousands, for ni- forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So do you see the clear connection just right there between God's name and God's identity? I, I like how Kevin DeYoung explains it in his book, Ten Commandments. He says this, the way to see God's glory is to hear God's name. To know the name Yahweh, the merciful and gracious one, is not merely to know something about God. It is to know God himself. God shows himself by speaking his name. To further illustrate how this works, DeYoung relates it to our own experience. He writes, over time, as people get to know us, our name embodies who we are. Think of someone whom you love deeply, your child, grandchild, parent, friend, or spouse, The name of that person represents more than a marking on a page. When someone says the name Trisha, I am overcome with good thoughts because I cannot separate my wife from her name. A whole flood of emotions, experiences, joys, and desires come to me at the sight or sound of those six letters put together in that name, end quote. Uh, We all know what that's like, don't we? And that's why the names of those we love are so precious to us and why we protect those names and the names of others, why, why we're very particular about how we use them. It's just intuitive that showing respect to someone's name shows respect to that person. And on the flip side, showing disrespect shows disrespect for that person. Uh, I remember one of my hockey coaches calling me Heinz Ketchup Really original, super lame. It's like, oh yeah, I haven't heard that one before. 
But it still bugged me because it felt like he was belittling me by misusing my name. I also remember visiting a church with my family many years ago, and after the service being greeted by one of the elders, who laughed when I told him my name was Jay. (laughs) You mean like the letter in the alphabet? Hi, I'm Jay. That's hilarious. Needless to say, we never visited that church again. (laughs) Uh, Colleen, I remember, was especially upset about it because it was a lack of respect, not just for my name, but for me, right? Something that everyone understands, except for this guy, I guess. But if it's common knowledge that the name of other people should be respected, if that's just basic human etiquette, how much more should the name of the Lord be respected? If God's name represents his manifold perfections, his glory, his greatness, his goodness, his grace, surely his name should be revered above all other, used with the greatest care. That's exactly what we see happening uh, all over the Old Testament, especially the Psalms. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name above the earth, Psalm 8.1. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, Psalm 29, 2. Blessed be his glorious name forever, Psalm 72, 19. And holy and awesome is his name, Psalm 111, verse 9. But we also see this in the New Testament, uh, most notably in Matthew 6, verse 9, when Jesus teaches his disciples past and present to first and foremost pray, as we just did, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We've all said that probably a thousand times before in the Lord's Prayer. But is that how we view God's name? Is that how we use God's name? Holding it highly, honoring it as holy with whatever we say? We should because this is the the implicit expectation of the third commandment. What it first of all requires, God's people must revere the meaning of God's name. As the Heidelberg Catechism sums up so well for children and new converts, in a word, it requires that we use the holy name of God only with reverence and awe so that we may properly confess him, pray to him, and praise him in everything we do and say. But in second, there's not just a that positive requirement. There's also an explicit negative uh, thing that's forbidden here as well, namely the misuse of God's name. And so back again in verse 7, we read, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Uh, A little translation would be, you shall not raise up Yahweh's name for no good. The essential meaning is a prohibition against just misusing God's name in any way. Uh, Many Orthodox Jews think that this means we should never speak God's name, the Lord Yahweh, under any circumstances, but that's clearly not the case. After all, God's divine name is used by his people all over the Old Testament, uh, nearly 7,000 occurrences. Rather, this is about not misusing his name taking the name of the Lord your God in vain or in an empty way. And we see elsewhere in the Old Testament and New Testament uh, that there's, there's three specific ways that this can happen, okay? And the first is this. We take God's name when we use in vain when we use it falsely. So Leviticus 19.12 says, Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. So you can imagine a criminal in a court of law saying, as the Lord is my witness, I didn't do it, when in fact he did do it, and is using God's name to support his falsehood. Or a fraudster saying, you know, I swear on the name of the Lord that I will not uh, misuse this information you're giving me. It's safe with me, when in fact what he wants to do is use that to take all of your money, right? Using God's name to bolster his credibility, These would be the kind of examples of misusing God's name in this way. It happens whenever we attach God's name to a lie, to anything we might communicate or claim that is not the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. This is why Jesus told his disciples not to use God's name at all in any oath in Matthew 5. But we also see in Scripture that this includes more than that. It also includes 
claiming that something is from God when it's not. In other words, it prohibits false prophecy, speaking for God when in fact God has not spoken, falsely attributing your words and your thoughts and your ideas to him. And this would become a big problem for the nation of Israel. As we read in Jeremiah 14, 13 to 14, for example, where it says, and the Lord, Jeremiah says, the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them to speak to them. They were prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. So trying to advance their own agenda, these false prophets attached God's name to what they were saying, thinking it would give them some kind of a spiritual authority. This is also what it means to speak the, the Lord's name in vain, to use it falsely. And, and of course, it's something that we continue sadly to see so much of today. It's the same thing when the many greedy, self-styled prophets on TV and online who claim to be speaking to God. And of course, most of the time, what God is saying is that you need to give them your money. When most of them have never said anything that's actually come true, which by the way, is the sign in Deuteronomy 18 of a false prophet who in the Old Testament was to be stoned to death immediately. I think that's something that uh, could be considered very seriously before people start attaching God's name to so-called prophecy. But it happens in other ways as well. It happens when people falsely um, attach God's name to their hate and prejudice. Or when they falsely attach God's name to their immoral lifestyle. Or when they attach uh, falsely God's name to their legalistic religious system. All of these also are using God's name falsely. And yet putting our words into God's mouth is actually a lot more common than just that. Whenever Christians say with with absolute confidence, God told me, God showed me, God led me, attaching God's name to their plans, they're risking taking his name in vain. How do you know for sure, objectively, that it was God who told you that and it's not just your imagination or worse, Satan? Or are you certain that it was God leading you in that direction and it's not just your own desires? Because if you're wrong... You just attached God's name to something that is false. Essentially practicing a kind of spiritual forgery. An unauthorized use of his name. And that's the first way we take the Lord's name in vain. When we use it falsely. When we attach it to something that is not objectively from God. But there's more. There's a second way. We also take God's name in vain when we use it flippantly. When we speak the name above all names in a casual, careless, cheap way. Like God's just our buddy. Hey, Lord. Or worse, like he's a genie. And if you just say his name enough times with enough enthusiasm, he'll have to do whatever you say. A problem that is especially prevalent in prayer, as Jesus points out in Matthew 6. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. So the Gentiles believe that if you said the name of their pagan gods over and over again, they're more likely to hear you and more likely to do what you say. Uh, Just think of the prophets in Baal in 1 Kings 18. That's what was happening there. Jesus forbids this sort of thing. Because the Lord our God is not like that. We don't have to keep saying his name over and over again. He can't be manipulated. Instead, we're told just to say, Our Father who are in heaven. That's the simple yet serious way we are to speak God's name as we speak to him. Like a respectful child coming to a righteous father who wants to give him good things. In other words, we must hallow his name. But let's be honest. honest. It's, it's very common today, maybe more than ever, to just throw out God's name like it's no big deal without even thinking Uh, Speaking to the Lord with casual catchphrases or speaking of the Lord with cringe-worthy Christianese. Al Mohler pulls no punches when addressing this in his book on the Ten Commandments. He writes this, If we could only hear ourselves talk, such chattering of religious nonsense, just listen to our talk about God 
Or for that matter, read our bumper stickers. God is our co-pilot, our dream weaver, our life artist, our friend, our coach, our therapist. Not Jehovah. He renders no therapy. He offers no coaching. He weaves no dreams. He reveals himself and and saves his people from their sin. He rules over all the earth and no one can limit his power. The triviality and the triteness of our triumphalist piety, the backslapping, easy familiarity with the things of God and his own name, this is truly a scandal among us. We avoid a canon of forbidden words, yet take the Lord's name in vain by the sheer cheapness of so much of how we speak when talking about God. Might that be true at times for me and for you, for how we speak of God? Listen, when we are careless with God's name, we inevitably cheapen God's name. Which is why the the, the many ways Christians are using God's name today is so concerning. When Christian entrepreneurs slap God's name on a t-shirt or coffee mug or bumper sticker, when Christian musicians include his name in a trivial pop song about nothing, when Christian athletes say before millions of people, I give credit to God and speak his name for the big win because he was on our side. When Christian politicians end their speeches with God's name to show that they're religious in some way, when Christian comedians include it in their church Uh, going audiences and their material. All of these and many more examples very well could be taking the name of the Lord in vain, using it flippantly. But there's still one final way this happens, and it's no doubt the most familiar. We take God's name in vain when we use it foully, when we curse with the name above all names, speaking blasphemy, whether it's, oh my God, or OMG, or Jesus Christ, when used profanely in a moment of amazement or a moment of anger, this is expressly forbidden. In fact, during the Old Covenant era, it was taken with such a seriousness that is shocking today. For example, when a woman's son blasphemed the name in Leviticus 24, we read, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. Think of that the next time you're tempted to substitute Lord or God or Christ for a curse. Or the next time you hear someone else do it. Of course, the problem is we become so desensitized, haven't we? We hardly even notice blasphemy let alone do anything about it, asking offenders to stop cursing God's name. Uh, I can't remember what it was called, but I remember watching a Christian movie years ago. It was really bad. (laughs) It was made poorly, but there was this one scene that was really powerful. Uh, A Christian time traveler from the early 20th century comes to the 21st century, and he soon finds himself in a movie theater with a small group from a church that he came upon. Now, the scene then shifts to an empty lobby, and suddenly the doors fly open, and out comes the time traveler with a look of horror on his face, and he's shouting everywhere, quick, somebody, someone, who's in charge? Stop the motion picture, stop everything. Someone took the Lord's name in vain. It must be stopped. As the members of the the small group come out to see what the commotion is, they they look at this time uh, traveler like he's absolutely crazy. So used to blasphemy, it's not really any big deal. And maybe we can take a cue from past Christians who took this command very seriously, uh, including substitutes for these curses, like gosh or geez, I think far too close to the real thing. While also challenging others to do the same, uh, like the rest of the Heidelberg Catechism explains, That we neither blaspheme or misuse the name of God by cursing, perjury, or unnecessary oaths, nor share in such horrible sins by being silent 
bystanders. God's people must reject the misuse of God's name in all these ways. That's the heart of the third commandment. But there's one final part. One final part at the end of verse 7, and it is the magnitude of God's name. It says, For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Or as the NASB puts it, the Lord will not let him go unpunished. Showing again, this is a very serious thing. That taking the Lord's name in vain must never be taken lightly. The Lord, it says, will not let anyone get away with misusing his name. Something that we see especially again in the book of Jeremiah. And the punishment for those who blaspheme through their false prophecy. Just listen to what it says will happen to them. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name. Although I did not send them. And you say, sword and famine will not come upon this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. But we also see this warning in the New Testament. In the words of Jesus, who said in Matthew 12, 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. By your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned which would certainly include breaking the third commandment. Something that is explicitly shown in uh, the New Testament because this is, in fact, going to be what is characteristic of the satanic powered, uh, empowered beast in Revelation. Revelation 13.6 describes him this way. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming in his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Well, as you know, when we get to Revelation 19, King Jesus captures this blaspheming beast and throws him into the lake of fire, along with those who follow his leads. Now, again, some might think this is extreme. What is the big deal with blasphemy? Is it really that bad to misuse God's name, to speak carelessly, to say, OMG? Well, as we've already seen, yes, It really is that awful because it is unauthorized by God. Uh, Just consider this analogy about the third commandment. Uh, It comes from Gary North. He writes this. One way for a modern American to begin to understand this commandment is to treat God's name as a trademark property. In order to gain widespread distribution for his copyrighted repair manual, the Bible, and also to capture greater market share for his authorized franchise, the church, God has graciously licensed the use of his name to anyone who will use it according to his written instructions. It needs to be understood, however, that God's name has not been released into the public domain. God retains legal control over his name and threatens serious penalties against the unauthorized misuse of this supremely valuable property. All trademark violations will be prosecuted to the full limits of the law. The prosecutor, judge, jury, and enforcer are God. So when we blaspheme, we are breaking God's law. And of course, as lawbreakers, we must be punished. It is just a matter of justice. But it's more than that. As we've already seen, misusing God's name is also a personal offense. It is a slight against his very identity. It is a smear of his supreme honor and glory. And anyone who does that, we see here, is supremely guilty. Listen, there is nothing more precious than the name of the Lord because it represents his priceless reputation which of course then should be protected. Yes, rightly used to magnify his glory, but never misused to misrepresent him in any way. That, friends, is a very great sin, which if we are all honest and we're letting the mirror of the law expose our own hearts, and our own mouths, we are all guilty of. 
in many, many ways. And if left to ourselves, it's very clear we will not be left unpunished by God. A truly sobering thought. And yet, the name of the Lord our God that we have taken in vain so often is not the only name that matters in this discussion. There's another name, a name that sadly also many people curse, even though there is no other name in heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is the name of the only Son of God. It literally means Savior. For as the angel said at his first coming, he will save his people from their sin. Those who believed in his name, the apostle John writes, he gave the right to become the children of God. Well, all those today who believe in the name of the Son of God likewise have eternal life. And when one day he comes again, the apostle Paul tells us that at his name, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that name, that precious name, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one and only hope for blasphemers like you and me. For only he has kept this third commandment perfectly, and only he was killed for us and our blasphemy sacrificially. Only he that perfect substitute, punished for our sin, for all the ways we've taken the Lord's name in vain so that we might be forgiven and set free. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, we read in, in Romans 10, 13. Remember in Exodus 20, verses 1 to 2, the, the prologue of the Ten Commandments, how clear it was that these commands are for those whom God has redeemed, that the law follows liberty, that God's demands only come after God's deliverance. And therefore, these are not to be obeyed as believers for our salvation, but from our salvation. Well, that salvation from the curse and condemnation of the law we've all broken, again, it is found nowhere else than in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God and Savior of the world, who the Old Testament uh, nation of Israel was, was looking forward to in faith. And now we look back to in faith, knowing his precious name. Only then, only when we, we call on his name are we then able to use his name in a way that glorifies him. Replacing all of that, that careless, cheap words cursing with boldly confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, have you called on the name of the Lord and been saved? Have you received that forgiveness for all of your blasphemies and every other sin and been freed to now obey him? And if you have, are you now confessing the name of the Lord Jesus Christ at home and at, and at work and at school and play? This, this is the best way to keep the third commandment. Church, fill your mouths with Christ. Speak of the Son of God. Share the good news of his salvation so there's no room for the misuse of his name. So that there's no place to be taking the Lord's name in vain. Take my voice, let me sing always, only for my King, Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Let's pray that would be true for us today. Lord, again, we're thankful for the opportunity to study the Ten Commandments together. 
And again, Lord, as the law, first of all, operates as that, that mirror that just shows us our true selves, it exposes our hearts, exposes our mouths and how we do use the Lord's name in vain in so many ways. Uh, Lord, that convicts us and it brings us to our place of need. But then it also, you, you lift our eyes then to Jesus, the name above all names, the name in whom, the only name in, in whom there is salvation and we find there forgiveness. We find there your grace and we find there the power to keep your commands. And so Lord, we pray that you would do that now. We consecrate our mouths to you. May we only speak in such a way that brings glory and honor to your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.